Here we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Life Inner Show. I'm your host, Jason Wojo. I'm joined by my co-host, Polish Peter. And on the Life Inner Show, in case you weren't aware, we help people create lives they love. We help them work less, make more, and do all the things that they find most valuable as determined by their Life Inner vision. You know, we're all about people having a great life. And on the show, we cover anything related to having a great life. And on today's episode in particular, we're interviewing a friend of mine. His name is Derek Sisterhen. He's written a book. Um, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to let him tell you what it's about, but it's very uh, provocative, but it's on the topic of marriage and money. And, you know, I don't know if there's a more polarizing discussion that has the potential for really, you know, getting people uh, riled up than talking about money, right? And especially when you're in a marriage you know, and how you look at money and, hey, this is mine, this is yours, no, we're together, no, I don't want you to buy that. Yes, but I mean, it's, what, what a topic, man. Well, rule number one of money, we don't talk about money, right? right, uh, right. <laughs> right, right. But here's the thing. Um, I think that's a, what Vojo said is such an important topic because um, my marriage ended because partially because of this particular topic. As I was listening to this particular episode, I'm looking back at my marriage. I mean, there were so many things that, uh, we didn't do as a married couple that ultimately, you know, that wasn't the only reason, but it was part of the reason why that happened the way that happened. So I just want to encourage you guys to really listen to it, whether you're married or not married, or, you know, you're divorced and you're looking at, you know, maybe in the future getting married again or whatever it might be. This is, I think, one of those eye-opening episodes that is going to give you a glimpse into how to have that conversation, what to talk about, and how to actually get on the same page. Because I think that's one yeah. of the biggest issues when it comes to money is that people are not on the same page. Yeah, I really enjoyed this interview with Derek. It's fantastic. Let's jump to it right now. Here's our interview with Derek Sisterhen on the topic of money and marriage. Derek, what's up, man? Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Life Inner Show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Man, I am so excited. Now, I know you, gosh, it's been several years now um, through our through Hope Community Church where we both uh, attend, and we had the pleasure of working together in the in the stewardship ministry. With, with For those of you who aren't in the church circles, stewardship means money uh, in most circles, and this means, you know, we're, we're stewards of a lot of different things, but in terms of when it comes to church, a lot of times the stewardship ministry is like, hey, let's help you with your finances. And related to that topic, you have written a book that is, and, and I love, by the way, I love this title because like, it's not at all what I've, what I've expected you to write as a title just from knowing you. And it's called Get Naked, Stripping Down to Money in Marriage. Man, and I- And church. All right. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. How did that go over? <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. A lot of the church folks really, they, they do want to get into the, the exciting stuff. They just want to talk about sex. <laughs> Um, so, I'm afraid to ask how you do your presentations. So this, <laughs> I keep it interesting. I keep it interesting, Peter. <laughs> so, so man, so tell me what 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 is it that made you write this book? Like, what was it that sparked this passion within you to address? Which is, by the way, this is. I mean, we've all heard, uh, and you could probably tell us what the stats are. Um, money seems to be like the number one thing couples argue over, couples fight over, couples cite as a reason for the divorce. Like big, big challenging problem here. Um, what, what made you write the book? Well, so the book first, let me address the title. The, the title is fun. It's fun because it gets your attention. Um, Good marketing. You, that's right. Yeah. Sex sells, right? Um, but it actually comes from a Bible verse. It comes from Genesis 2.25. This is right after uh, Adam meets Eve and they're joined together. And it says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, and so the, the idea of this like complete intimacy, complete vulnerability, uh, and, and the ability to have complete freedom within that and feel no shame. That was actually what's underneath of that title. So there's more to it than just, uh, wow, man, I actually really like that now that you explained it. Yeah. So, so why did I write the book? Well, it, partly it's, it's so that I could document a bit of my own experience in um, my, in the early days of my marriage with my wife. Um, we, we had known each other for several years. We'd been dating for about three, three and a half years before we got married. 
Um, we felt like we were coming into our marriage with our eyes wide open about who each other was, what we valued, what was important to us. We went through a premarital counseling program. We felt kind of like we did all the right things that you're supposed to do to set yourself up well. And yet within just a few months of getting married, we were starting to really have a lot of tension and um, stress and arguments over money. And we can get more into that. I don't think our story is that unique. It's um, as we go into this conversation here, but we were, we were grinding around this issue of money. And what it really boiled down to is we had never done the business of truly talking about how we saw, uh, how, we, how we wanted to manage money, how uh, we kind of viewed money more, say, principally or, or philosophically, um, and then how, uh, how we were going to honor what each other valued and have a little bit of an openness there to say, there might be some things that are important to you that aren't necessarily as important to me, but in order for us to have a healthy marriage, we've, we've actually got to value that for each other. Um, so it, it's a little bit kind of autobiographical, but then I also was really fortunate, um, several years after getting married, I, I left, uh, my career in banking and started working as a personal financial consultant. And I was very fortunate to work with literally hundreds of families over the course of, of several years. And I, I got to kind of get these glimpses. When you deal with people's finances, you get a window into every aspect of their life. Um, because money, the math of money is really just the fruit, if you will, on a tree that has really deep roots. It's really just the, the expression of what people value, what's important to them, uh, also what's not important to them. And so I got this really clear and, and kind of um, unexpected window into the very depths of the lives of a lot of people. And so between my own experiences and what I got to see with clients that I was working with, um, I kind of pulled together what, what ended up turning into the book of Get Naked. Man, I, I love that. What? So I have a lot of questions for you. I'm just going to start rapid fire here. The <laughs> first ahead. thing I'm wondering is like, why don't, why don't more people do this? Why don't more people have that discussion that you alluded to? Like, is this because the, the, the path that it seems to happen is like, no, you know, this is, this is my, this is my money. I'm going to spend it my way. You spend your money. And there's just constant tension, different philosophical, philosophical views, different beliefs. Um, different spending patterns. Where have you seen most people go wrong? Is it, is it not having that original conversation? Is it being caught in their own way and they're, and they're too stubborn to, uh, to look at the other person's perspective? Like what are some of the biggest mistakes you see with these people that you've helped in the past? Well, I think let's kind of, let's kind of go back to a really high level view and think about marriage in the first place, because, uh, marriage is this, uh, wild and crazy idea that you're going to take two imperfect, incomplete people, and then you're going to have them somehow live life together. And if, if one of the first lessons that I think I, I was forced to learn, um, this isn't one of those lessons you want to learn, you're forced to learn in marriage, is uh, that I'm kind of an arrogant, prideful person. And I want things to happen my way. And again, that's, that's one of those, that's those lessons that you don't really want to have to learn. You just kind of want to do things your own way. Well, but the problem is the end game for that is you're going to be alone and you're probably going to be miserable uh, because nobody really wants to be around somebody that's constantly saying it's my way or the highway. Well, most people don't overtly in marriage come out right out of the gate and say, it's going to be my way or the highway. I mean, if that is the case, if anybody's in pre-marriage right now, <laughs> and you're sensing that about your potential partner, I would say you need to run that uh, red flag up the flagpole and get some help. But again, the idea here is when we go into a marriage, if you come with the attitude that I'm going to make this other person fall in line with what I want to do, that's a recipe for disaster. So there's a humility that has to grow and, and being humbled is not easy, but it is right. It is good. And so what I've found out personally was 
I had to start letting some of the things that I wanted to happen my way. I had to let that go to the side a bit because there's also this other fact, which is sometimes my way is not the best way. Um, and to be open to listen to what my, my wife has to say and be open to, uh, to, again, value her perspective on the matters at hand. Now, most of the clients that I worked with, if they were having tension over money, a lot of it could stem from uh, one person had an agenda one way and another and the other person had an agenda in a different way. And so one of the most important things that we have to work through in a practical sense is saying, OK, first off, we're going to we're going to say, yes, we got to get to a place where we can put the agendas down a little bit. But what can we find in common? What, where can we find some common ground here that's important? And I, I, this probably sounds a lot more like just general marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. But again, like I said, the money is just the representation of what's going on within the relationship or within the value systems of the people. Um, but in many ways, that's what it comes down to is, okay, what can we agree on? What would we both say is important? And how can we start working toward that? So I got a question for you as you're speaking, something popped up for me and this seems like a pretty easy question to answer, but knowing humans, right? How we operate, what we do and how we think and what we say, how do you know it's a money issue? Like when you start having conversations with these people, right? How do you know, or even in your marriage, right? You argue about money, right? But how do you know it's a money issue? Uh, so, Peter, in my experience, um, it's usually not a money issue. Uh, there's usually something else going on there that is manifesting itself as a financial problem. Um, so let's let's use an example of uh, well, we'll let's pick on kids for a second. I've got kids, so I can, I'll pick on some kids. Um, one of the commonalities that I see for a lot of families where they've got children, and this is true whether it's a, a single parent home or it's a married couple with kids, is there can, there's a temptation to elevate the, ch the importance of the children in the family to the point that the parents are orbiting around the children. And so whatever the child wants, we're going to give them. Um, if they want to do a lot of different activities, sports, whatever it might be, extracurricular activities, we're going to sign up and commit lots of time lots of energy, lots of financial resources toward that. If they want to do lots of video games, we're going to make sure that we're going to keep that going. Because there's, I don't know if, if, I don't know if there's something that uh, is kind of built into becoming a parent, but you don't ever want to be a parent that's judged by other parents, right? We, we sometimes uh, no. get ourselves wrapped up on all that. And that never happens that we're judged by other people. <laughs> no, no, never, never. I've never seen no. that happen. And so we, we can tend to put our, our kids on a pedestal. And the other thing is, is we put pressure on ourselves to say, we want them to have a better experience growing up than maybe we did. Even if we had a decent experience growing up, we want them to have an even better one. The outflow of that can be lots of time commitments that might be unhealthy in the overall relationship of the family. Um, and it can be a lot of financial resources that get committed to things that may be beyond what is really healthy for the family. So the, the issue, the root issue there is not necessarily that, okay, we're spending a lot of money on a lot of stuff or a lot of activities for these kids. The root issue is perhaps we've put our kids in an unhealthy place relationally in our family, uh, and it has tremendous costs. Yeah, I love that that you shared that because, yeah, I mean, there is something that's underneath it that needs to be discussed, right? Yeah. And then the money conversation from what I'm getting from you it gets resolved in that conversation, right? Because if it is we're elevating the kids above to what they're supposed to be, let's agree on what that, where we're going to be. Like, how do you resolve that issue? Like, you know, let's talk about, like you use the example with kids, right? And we're talking about we're spending a lot of time and money on the activities, extracurriculars, and, you know, maybe all those different things. So how you resolve that conversation. So, you know, the humble aspect that you talked about earlier kind of comes down to guys get on the same page. How does that work? Yeah. Well, you know, and this, this is where um, it probably does help depending on the level of how extreme potentially the, uh, the, the imbalance in the relationship and the family, that family dynamic is, it might be helpful to seek counsel 
and get somebody that could be a true expert to help a, you know, a family counsel, counselor, family therapist of some sort. But generally speaking, I think a lot of it comes back down to asking the questions and, and actually taking the time to do the hard work of getting to some answers, saying, how do we want this, how do we want this family to go? Like, how, how, do, wh how do we know what, uh, what a healthy family looks like? Okay, well, let's write a list of all, what is a healthy family? How do we know that we're, we are living out a healthy family dynamic? Okay, now what is it that we need to change based off of where we are today to get there? And it's probably, just being, just being blunt, there's probably a lot of business that those parents have to do with potentially making idols out of the children that they never realized that they had actually done. Um, oftentimes in some of the classes that, I teach and have had the pleasure of teaching with Jason. Um, we really want people to focus on what's underneath their belief system and asking the question, why we do what we do? Why have we put ourselves in this position? Why are we facing the challenges that we're facing really helps you get underneath of that. So that would be one of the places that I would start, but let's pretend that a family did that and they realized, Hey, we're, we're kind of all a mess. We're all out of sorts. And we figured out that we needed to make some changes. Our kids were stressed out. They were overwhelmed. So we said, let's pull things back. Everybody's going to pick one extracurricular, you know, per season. We're not going to have everybody running around the 17 different activities every day. Um, but here's where we are. We've got five grand on credit cards that has accumulated over the past couple of years that we need to figure out a way to pay off. It's like, okay, now we can have a financial conversation because you guys have built a new foundation and now we just have to clean up the mess from the old, the old way. So it sounds like that, like even, even proceeding working on this problem has to come number one, the humility to not. And, and actually when I'm thinking of humility, it's not only in considering probably the way your spouse views money and perhaps that it's different than yours. You probably have to look at your own spending patterns. If you're being honest with yourself, uh, and have the have the ability to to dissect that. Um, plus, actually, you know, one of the things that it, it seems it has to do with money. Well, actually, let me finish that. So it's you have humility first, and then an openness and a willingness to admit that something isn't working. Like you have to have that openness with yourself and the honesty. You're like, hey, this isn't helping us. We need to kind of and and the way you do that, it sounds, is like. What are the things that are most important to us as a couple, as a family, as a unit? Because now we are a unit. And I love what you said earlier, like we're two imperfect people now living together. Like how much, can it, can it get any more challenging, you know? Um, and so with that, I'm also thinking like, there seems to be, you know, why are pe why do people hold on to, do you think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hardwired thing where people are so, they get so uptight when it comes to money? Like money just seems like this. You mentioned that it's, it's the fruit, but like, why do people like this seems to like, you know, you tell, so you talk about money and it just automatically like, you know, we, we've all heard, you know, you don't talk about, you know, religion and money and mm. politics. Right. Like, so it's like taboo, right. Right. So, so how do you get people to accept that? No, that's not true. In fact, not talking about it is hurting you. Yeah. That's, a, I mean, it's a great question. Um, so money is deeply connected to our value system. Um, and, and you can, you can read quotes aplenty about, um, how, what we value is what made is made manifest in what our, our finances look like. And even so much as, you know, Jesus himself said in Matthew six twenty one, wherever your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So what's important to you gets expressed in the financial choices that you make. And I think that's one of the reasons why people even married, married people who've seen each other naked. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why they can even struggle is because we can get defensive into say, thinking, gosh, I don't want you to pick on what I might be spending money on or what I might think is important to direct resources toward because that's important to me. And, and like I said, part of the work that we have to do sometimes is, is ask ourselves the question, but why? Why is that so important to me? Um, in some cases, it's because we had an example set for us 
when we were growing up or maybe uh, getting into our early adulthood or that period of time, you know, depending on when you get married, before you get married, where you've got some influences on you or some examples being set for you by parents and other people that are important that might be good or might be bad examples. And they start to catalyze into your belief system a framework. And this is how I'm going to value money. This is how I'm going to handle things. I actually borrowed a quote from a, a really great book um, back when I was working on mine. Um, it comes from a book called The Most Important Year in a Man's Life. And then if you flip it over and read it the other way, it's The Most Important Year in a Woman's Life. Um, so it's two books in one. That's a good deal. Um, <laughs> anyway, let me, let me read this quote for you. They said, if, you're, if your parents argued about money, that was normal for you. If your dad paid the household bills because he didn't trust your mother with the checkbook, that was normal. If your dad surprised your mother with new cars, if your mother went shopping like it was a daily sport, even when she didn't need anything, if your parents lived with heavy credit card debt, if your parents tried to hide their expenditures from each other, if your parents always waited until they could pay cash before they bought something, all of these things were normal for you you're bringing them into your marriage as standard equipment. And so I think when we get into the issue of uh, understanding what we value, sometimes we have to get into, well, what was modeled for me and how much of that have I kind of taken on myself? Um, oftentimes I'll talk with folks where they'll say, I had a terrible example that was set for me. Um, my parents were always stressed out. They were always living paycheck to paycheck or maybe not even making it paycheck to paycheck and using debt to kind of float themselves. I, so I made a commitment. I was never going to live that way. And so they become that they swing the pendulum all the way to the other side. And they say, I now hold on to money so tightly uh, that I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm unwilling to be a spender. I'm unwilling to part with it. And effectively what they've done is they've become dysfunctional in the other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you've got, if you get married and you say, I am never going to live like my parents lived and you marry somebody that just happens to be a spender, they don't, doesn't mean they want to be reckless, but maybe they want to spend some money sometimes. Um, that can really grate against you and create conflict if you don't work out what's underneath of that value system. Man, so, you said a lot there. Go ahead, Peter. No, so what I'm hearing from you is, I mean, it comes down to the discussion and you talked about the belief system. I'm hearing in the book, actually, you talk about the belief system, right? Because mm -hmm. if your parents did this and all that kind of stuff, like me personally, I came out of a communist country, right? So a of scarcity, a of scarcity, and I say a of scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. But now when it comes to having that marriage, so tell me, how do we do it? Like, what do we do? Does this, the one person is the head of the money or is it like a split 50-50 or what do we do, right? I mean, do we have our own, own accounts and I have my piggy bank and you have yours or what's the deal, man? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question. And the, the short answer is we need to do whatever we can do to facilitate constant communication. Um, when you get into the vacuum of we're not communicating about what's going on financially, that's where strange and often problematic things start to grow. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of, you know, we'll, you're, you're getting into some of the really practical stuff. One of the biggest, most important things that my wife and I did that helped us start to get out of the rut that we were in when it came to our, how we handled money was we simply said, we're going to sit down uh, we're going to sit down separately uh, and we're going to write out some of the goals that we have, some of the things that we would like to see accomplished that do cost money uh, in the next six months, in the next 12 months, and in the next 24 months. And then we're going to lay those lists down side by side and we're just going to let it spark a conversation. I want to see what's important to you and I want you to see what's important to me. And here's what was crazy. Probably two thirds of, of what we had put down were pretty much the same. Um, so we already had had a lot of, a lot of common, um, commonly held goals and commonly held dreams and things that we wanted to see happen. We just hadn't really started to talk about what we were going to do to make it happen and do it together. And then we had, there was some stuff that my wife thought was important. And there were some things that I thought were important 
uh, you know, that we weren't necessarily fully, uh, uh, we, we weren't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily seeing it as important to me that might have been hers or vice versa. But again, it allowed us to have a conversation to say, well, if, if we think this group of important goals uh, needs to be what we focus on, well, what's something that matters to you that we can add to the list and what's something that at, I can add to the list from mine? And now we can talk about how we're going to make a plan to do it. But if you don't set the time aside to actually have that conversation, you're going to constantly be guessing or you're going to constantly uh, be assuming, and that can, well, you know what they say about assuming. Um, so that's one practical thing. Peter, to your question about managing the money separately or together, um, I, I'll be honest with you. I have, I've worked now at this point in my working life, I've probably counseled with at least 400 to 500 different families. Um, I have never seen a success story of people that manage their money separately. Um, in marriage. Now, in marriage. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that they aren't out there, but I'm saying that the likelihood is very, very, very small that that, it, that, that would be, some, um, that that might be your story. Uh, the experience that I have actually says you got to go the other way. You need to bring it together because, again, it, it inspires more conversation, more opportunity to communicate about what's important more opportunity to celebrate when we accomplish things that we set out to do. Um, and honestly, I think it just breeds more intimacy. Uh, the, one of the primary reasons why money issues cause uh, problems is because we're not dealing, we're not communicating about what matters. Um, mm -hmm. When we do it together, we get to have that level of communication. If you communicate well, you grow in your intimacy, you grow in your love and you grow in your care for each other. Is there a recommended frequency that you've seen work more than others? Is it once a week, once a month, when as needed? Like how do, how do people start to get this on the calendar? Well, so my, my, uh, my recommendation is at least once a year, you need to sit down and kind of map out what you're looking at. I, I call it the dreams and goals exercise. First, it can just be, let's just kind of brainstorm separately the different uh, dreams that we might have financially for the next short period. I don't typically like to go out much more than three years just because there's so much in the fog that lives out there past three years. Um, I know I, one of those common questions of what's your five-year plan? It's like, I don't know. I'm just trying to get through the week. Um, but I think three years is a good number to give you some form of orientation, uh, but I wouldn't go much farther than that. So I would say once a year, you sit at a minimum, you sit down and do that. For some folks, particularly if you're working through maybe a, a financial, personal financial turnaround uh, season, so maybe you're working through getting rid of some debt or uh, you're trying to save up some money for something um, or maybe just trying to save for an emergency fund, something basic like that, it might be worth doing this more on like an every six month type of schedule just so that we can stay steady on um, and make sure that we keep the communication going. Got it. Got it. You know, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Derek, this is, this is not quite related to marriage specifically, but it kind of is. What about the baggage that people bring to a marriage? Like, Hey, I have a hundred grand student loans. Hey, I have 20 grand in credit card debt. Hey, I have, a, you know, that seems to be something like, you know, I, I see some couples agreeing like, Hey, listen, this is us moving forward, but I'm not sure how I feel about what you've done prior to us getting married. How do, how do you help people resolve that? Yeah. That's a tough well, one, man. That's a tough one. <laughs> um, you know, again, I'll, I'll we'll get I'll, married. Once you pay off the debt, first you pay <laughs> off the debt. Once you do that, then we'll get married. Right. That's how you do it. That's I, you know what? I think that makes a lot of sense, Peter. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's certainly, certainly, uh, you know, creates some incentive maybe, um, or maybe disincentive, depending on how much debt there could be. Uh, you know, here's the thing for me is if two people find, find that they're, they, they know that they are uh, supposed to be together, well, you kind of get the whole person and you get the whole person where they are today. Now, they may have made some mistakes in the past that they bear consequences for in the form of debt and things like that, um, but you're getting who they are today. And 
you know, again, I'll, I'll draw a little bit from, you know, what, what scripture says. It says that uh, the man leaves his father and his mother. He's joined to his wife and they become one flesh. That means everything's coming together. And that's hard. We live in a, in our modern age. Um, we, we kind of want people to pick up the pieces of whatever's happened in their past and financially in particular and hey, that's your issue. You need to go deal with that. I don't feel like that's a, a very healthy way to, to start a marriage because part of, again, part of marriage is saying, I know I'm not perfect. Uh, I, I know that you're not perfect. Um, and part of our imperfection could be some of these things that we bring into the marriage. But let's try to work toward this together. Well, you know, I love that you said that. And the other thing I'm thinking of is like how, if you're trying to show your spouse how much you care about them, how much you accept them, how much you guys are a team now, what greater kind of expression of that, of acceptance of that, of like, hey, I'm going to help you carry this burden that, that you, uh, that you, uh, you know, had uh, way before we even met. And I, now that's me too. I'm going to help. We're a team now. We, we, we're going to do this together. Like, it's not just you. It's not just me. We're, we're a team. We're going we're gonna to work through all this together. Like, how much more, I mean, of, of a great illustration could that be than that you both really are on the same page? Um, I think that's really important. And, you know, it's just, yeah, I mean, you, you get married. You're, if they have kids, if they have, you're taking their kids, you're taking their credit score, everything, everything comes with them. Um, all, and so I think, uh, yeah, that's, I, I love that answer, man. Um, and so we talked, so we're talking about opening up, being humble. We're talking about having conversations. We're talking about opening the platform uh, and hearing what the other person is saying. Um, what, when, do you have any guidelines for more specifics as to, and also just to summarize, what are, what are the things we're trying to do together? What are our dreams together? What are our goals together? These are all, these are all great. Um, what other things have you seen as being sticking points for people when they go through this process? Is, is there, I mean, at this point, four or 500 couples, you've seen the same things pop up over and over again, most likely. You've seen patterns. Um, what are some of those patterns that we haven't even discussed yet? Uh, I think, I think we've, we've kind of hit on some of them, at least at a high level so far throughout the conversation. The, the, the pattern, you, you've probably heard me say the word communication now about 100 times so far in this discussion. Uh, the pattern that is most frequently non-existent or not enough existent in, uh, in the lives of couples that are struggling going around the issue of money is they're just not communicating enough or they're not communicating productively. Um, and again, a lot of that comes back to um, potentially uh, what you've, you've brought in from your, your history, what example was set for you. If you've been married for a little while, are you, do you feel like it's a, it's a safe subject to communicate about? Do we need to potentially uh, sort of redraw the, the rules and the guidelines for how we're going to communicate? Um, you know, again, for us, it was very, for my wife and I, it was very important to, to start with dreaming. Let's, let's think about where it is that we want to go and how can we work together to get there? Well, that really helps to frame up the communication uh, to get a lot more healthy and productive because now we're talking in terms of, well, what helps us stay on track to accomplish these things that we both agreed were important and we valued and we said we wanted to do together. Um, and if we're doing something that's kind of taking us uh, off of that path, then that's a good opportunity for us to address that too. Or perhaps something we thought was important, and then a little bit of time goes by and you say, eh, you know what, uh, that doesn't matter quite as much as we thought it was, uh, as we thought it would. Um, so I think the, the, probably the biggest issue is the lack of productive and, and fruitful conversation and communication about money. We use uh, something like a, a monthly budget, uh, which budgets, we, we can't say budget in my house because uh, it implies too many restrictions on spending. Um, so we call it a spending plan. Uh, and that's for my wife. So that means that we're going to spend some money. Well, we started to look at the spending plan as, hey, every month, it's, an, it's another opportunity for us to talk. It's another opportunity for us to talk not only about what's coming up this coming month, but also how does this next month's spending plan incorporate in a little bit more progress towards one of our goals? And so 
again, I'm, I'm, I'm laying out a little bit of what some productive and healthy communication looks like, but that's to kind of give the counterpoint against the, the fact that the typical pattern is there isn't productive, there isn't healthy communication because I've seen people that don't have a debt issue, but they've got a communication issue. I've seen people that have a massive debt issue and they've got a communication issue. When you start to work that stuff through and you say, start to see how we can value a few things together and talk about it regularly, we can build a plan, a financial plan that makes progress. Man, I love that. And, you know, what, as I find myself sitting here and thinking of like, well, what if this, what if that, you essentially by giving us this overarching theme of communication uh, and commonality, what are, we, what are we really trying to accomplish together? With that as the filter, all these other things will answer themselves. You know, should we get a new car, or used car? Should we pay for the kids' college, or should they pay some of it? Should we support our parents, or you know, as they, or you know, all these spending questions? Really, it all comes back to what you said. Like, what's what's best for us as a family, as a unit? What's healthy? What's going to make us healthy uh, in this relationship? And I think that's using that as the overarching principle that you just constantly go back to, and being open with them really sounds like that. That's the key, man. Um, and I know you talk about more, uh, more details in your book and there's a lot, and you talk and, and you mentioned this, you know, and by the way, guys go to, go to Amazon and pick it up, um, get naked, stripping down to money and marriage. But, um, and this, there's a, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. And I think if people can learn to deal with this issue, you know, who knows what the effect on our divorce rate would be like this one issue alone, right? Um, if people learn how to communicate here, uh, it's going to spill over into all these other areas because, like you mentioned, like the, this, this is just one area that's the fruit of these underlying beliefs and their identity and the things they've been taught. Uh, and so, as we can change that, we can change like so many, so many different things. Um, and we didn't even talk about this, but we're we're providing a model for our kids, right? Like this yes. is some. So this is going to be a pass down. Yeah, and it's interesting. At the time that I wrote this book, I actually didn't have children. And um, there's, so I've, I've kind of had this thought at some point, I should probably write a follow-up called staying naked, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to incorporate in the, the piece with the kids, because um, I do allude to it a little bit towards the end of the book, but there is a, there is a legacy that gets established when a couple is able to handle money together in a healthy way um, that will have multiple generations of impact. Um, in, in the exact same way that an unhealthy relationship with an unhealthy management of money can create multiple generations of negative impact, we can flip that and make it positive. And, and uh, to your point, Jason, um, regarding divorce rates and things like that, yes, money is often cited as one of the primary causes of divorce. Uh, one of the other kind of aims of this book is how can we flip the script and potentially money becomes one of those vehicles that allows us to grow in deeper intimacy, um, to be able to talk more about what matters to us, to be able to plan ahead together and actually enjoy the journey of living out life together and, and talking through uh, uh, the things that matter most and, and aiming for the things that we wanna see um, they cost money, you know, <laughs> so we got to talk about the money stuff, but it really becomes more of the avenue for talking about really what matters uh, in a marriage. Man, I, I love got, that. I got a couple of questions for you. What are like two lessons that you pass on to your children in regards to money? Uh, two lessons that you pass on to your children in regards to money. Well, there are, there are lots of different lessons. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say, uh, the first lesson is going to be um, around a healthy relationship with money. Um, do, do you show that happiness only comes with either saving lots of money or buying things with money? Basically, it's, it's can, can you set an example of contentment so that they don't feel like, so that they, now I'll set this aside for a second. Kids are, kids are their own, they, they grow up into their own independent people, right? Um, they might be predisposed to think that happiness comes from acquiring things or acquiring more dollar signs in their bank account. Um, but can you set an example that at least shows them what it looks like to be content? 
that's an incredibly important lesson to try to pass along. And then I think the other one, and unfortunately, this is not one, uh, even though the example was set for me, I did not really learn it until later on, is how to incorporate generosity into your life. And mm. I think that that goes hand in hand with contentment, because if you are able to give some of your money away, that is a good reminder that you're not the center of the universe and that there are other people out there that you can make a positive impact on. And um, when, we, when we tend to only think about what we want for ourselves, uh, that fuels a materialistic and selfish kind of disposition. And um, you know, I think for my kids, one of the things that we're really trying to work through is how can, how can we show them how to take and incorporate some habits of generosity early on in their lives? I love it. Man, that's great. Derek, I really want to thank you for being on Life in Our Show. This has been phenomenal. I know we're going to get great feedback on this. Uh, guys, if you're looking to pick up the book, you can get it on Amazon. Or Derek, is that where you send people or do you have somewhere else? Yeah, you can go to Amazon or DerekSisterHen.com. You want to show what it looks like so people can see it? The book? Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. There it is. Oh, you Check got it. underwear on there. All right. Yeah, that's underwear. Underwear <laughs> on there. Right. It's a great conversation starter when people come over to your house and they're like, what in the world is that book? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Derek. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, man. Wow. What, a, what an interview. I'll tell you, I really enjoyed what he said. And, you know, I was, as he's talking, I kept having ideas pop in my head. It's like, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And he answered all of them really by just saying, hey, you know, here's what you got to focus on. Of course, there's these one-off situations and we got to be strategic and tactical with certain things. But like, you know, at the core, we, number one, we got to have a humility to listen, to admit that, you know, maybe our way of doing things isn't the only way, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, recognizing what we are together on. What are our common uh, goals. What are our common dreams? What do we want to accomplish as a couple? How can we be healthy together? And then three is like the normal, open, honest, frequent communication. And those are the really, the, I would say that if I had to distill down uh, the three things that are the most important to be on the same page with when it comes to this topic. That's it. That's all you have. I got a lot more, but that's the top three. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. But here's the thing. One thing that kept reoccurring for me as I was listening to it from a life on their standpoint like when I coach my students and we come to a, a tough decision that needs to be made, right? Choice that you need today when it comes to maybe a business opportunity, whatever it might be. What goes back? What do I say to them? I say to them, well, what does your vision say? So one thing that, you know, it recurred for me during this particular episode and he mentioned, right? Sitting down at the beginning of the year and looking at the goals, right? What's your three-year goal. To me, what I hear is the life on their vision, Right the husband and wife create the life on their vision based on what we teach. And then when it comes to those tough decisions, going back and it's like, well, does this align with our visions? Yeah. Does it help us get closer to our vision or further away? And I think a lot of those questions that we have as a person, as a couple, right. And humility, that's huge. Right. Because man, it's, you know, I'm not always right kind of a thing. It takes something for you to be able to do that. But once you start looking from that perspective, all of a sudden those tough choices, decisions that we're looking to make become a little bit easier and you get closer to that one page and you can make financial decisions. And I think what ends up happening, those financial conversations, those money conversations become a lot more fun, right? Become yeah. fun that you actually look well, forward to. But like something like easier. you just look forward to them. Yeah, and yeah. easier. Like, so you, let's say you guys have a have a vision together, and now all of a sudden you want to buy a new car versus a used one. Well, that that dream and goal that you guys wrote down is going to tell you should you get the new car or not. You know, is it in alignment with it or isn't it? You know, and there's there's a there's a myriad of of different choices that you're going to have to make that are regarding your finances. But the biggest thing, like the, the other thing, I'll tell you has been really. Uh, I'll tell you when I. My first marriage, similarly, like we really handled things very, very differently. Um, I also really wasn't a Christian at that point in my life. And so I've learned a lot of things about money. Like I, you know, this isn't the topic of the show, but like I even started to look at, you know, money, it's not even my money, it's God's money. And, uh, and when I got married um, to my wife now, like I really laid it down to the relationship and said, this is, this is us. This is, we're a team. And I think 
I I orig- I had a little bit of a I wouldn't say a big problem with it. Um, but there was a little bit of resistance there because there's fear behind that, like letting somebody else in, uh, on, you know, there's so many justifications like, Oh, I, I made this money or I make more than you are. I make less than you. And there's so many justifications we come up with to keep this separate, but it's all, they're all lies there. It's, it's don't like Derek said, like put it together, like just be one unit. That's how you succeed as a team. Like if you're, I want you to think for for a moment now you're, you're playing basketball and there's, there's two people versus one, right? Like why the, the, the one person, um, isn't gonna, gonna succeed as easily as two people that are on a team together. Uh, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, and so you got to realize like be on the same page is, is a huge, huge, uh, advantage, not just financially, but for your relationship. This is a place, like Derek said, where you can grow in your intimacy. Like when you open yourself up to this, to, to your partner, uh, and, and you guys are on the same page, like that takes a lot of trust and trust, you know, builds, builds, uh, attraction and builds intimacy. All right. The other aspect that I just heard, um, during this particular episode, it's, and I bring that up sometimes too, it's, it's never about money. And yeah. I think the money conversation is not about money. And I think when you start looking from that perspective, because whether we guys are talking about the money, right? Like whether we buy this car or not. And if it's not about money, there is something underneath it, like the beliefs or whatever. Well, guess what? Those beliefs span all kinds of different areas of your life, whether it's money, whether it's health, whether it's all kinds of stuff, right? So when you get on a similar page on that, all of a sudden life in general will start working a little bit better. Makes sense. Yeah. I think that is, that's well, an important aspect. And we talk about that at the Get a Life Getaway where we tell people like, what's the, what's the belief uh, behind what you spend money on? Like, you know, if you, if you're right. spending five bucks a day at Starbucks, why is that? Is it because you enjoy the feeling of feeling uh, exclusive or, or is it because you um, are looking to be social and get out of the house? Is it because you uh, have you had some great experience when you were younger at Starbucks and you have a memory there? Like, so start to look into why you spend money the way you do. It's incredibly enlightening because there also could be a less expensive or even free and or better way to do it that doesn't even require money. There's a story in the Life in Your Book about the boat. You know, if you know if you read the Life in Your Book, you know what I'm talking about. I don't want, I don't want to tell the story here. It's too long. Uh, but knowing what you're really after is incredibly empowering. And you know, the last thing I want to cover here is when he talked about the lessons to leave your kids, like how powerful is that man? I once heard it said, don't, don't give your kids what you never had teach your kids what you were never taught. And that's, I think what Derek was alluding to in this book is like, you know, teach your kids by example, by example of what it looks like to, to, to handle finances in a good way, in a healthy way, because that's also going to lead by the way, to a great marriage, which by the way, now is going to, influence your kids on what a healthy relationship and a marriage looks like, right? What an incredible opportunity to sow seeds uh, into your children. Yep. Awesome, I agree. Awesome. And that, listen, that goes whether you're married or not and you have yeah. the kids. You sure. Know what I mean? Awesome. Well, hey guys, hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did and Peter did as well. Um, We would love to hear from you. Please leave us a review or subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And if you would like to be part of the Life Inner community, you can join us over in the Life Inner app. It's free. We also have a special gift for you over there. It's our Life Inner Fast Start Kit, which gets you up to date on things like creating a vision. We have worksheets to help you craft out uh, uh, specifically uh, and clearly what your ideal life would look like. We also have training in there on the four stages of finding prosperity and a number of other things you'll find valuable as you pursue the life and business you love as always thank you for listening we'll see you next time